Um, so uh, well, welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to in introduce Shubham Tulsiani, um, who is an assistant professor in the Robotics Institute um, here at CMU. His group, uh, sorry, um, yeah, his group is interested in building perceptive systems that can infer the spatial and physical structure of the world that they observe. Prior to CMU, he was a research scientist at Facebook AI Research in Pittsburgh. He received a PhD in computer science from UC Berkeley in 2018 and a BTEC in computer science and engineering from IIT Kanpur in 2013. He was also awarded the best student paper in CVPR 2015 and was supported by the Berkeley Fellowship. Let's all welcome Shiva. Thanks, Ray, for the introduction. Uh, so, a couple logistical things. It's, I want to sort of keep this informal, so please feel free to stop me if you have any questions. People who are here and those who are on Zoom, hopefully, we'll be able to hear you. Um, and, you know, please also feel free to tell me if I'm not loud enough to be heard at the back. Uh, yeah, so with that, today I wanted to talk about, well, I've changed the talk title a bit, but uh, towards trying to reconstruct everyday objects in 3D. Um, and I'm not sure if this isn't working. Let's see. Okay, great. Um, so in the computer vision community, our goal has always been to build some systems that given an image such as this one, can make interesting inferences about it. And especially over the last few years, we have made a remarkable amount of progress in being able to at least detect or recognize and even segment out the objects that are present in images. Uh, for example, if you take the state of the art, instant segmentation systems does mark, mask RCNN, it can very quickly and accurately tell you uh, there are certain objects in it, such as uh, the chair or the table or the couch on the left. And it can even find some of the tiny ones, such as the books that you see on the right of the image. And while these results are very impressive, they're all trying to understand this 2D image that you're seeing by labeling the pixels and the objects in it. And what this pursuit of sort of 2D understanding forgets is that you know, this image that we see is actually just a window to the 3D world behind it. That uh, in some sense, this is just a painting that's depicting the underlying physical and spatial reality. And that any robot that is there in this environment that wants to sort of act in the world, that robot doesn't really care about this image. What it cares about is this underlying physical 3D world that the robot will operate in. And so while we made a lot of progress in trying to infer <clears throat> you know, the 2D segmentation of the various objects, we also should be able to understand the 3D world behind images. And so that actually has been one of the longstanding goals in computer vision, uh, that of given some single or a sparse set of 2D images, try to understand the underlying 3D world. And this is what I sort of want to talk about today. But if I express this goal to you that I want to be able to infer 3D representations from images, at least if you're very just cursorily familiar with the success of computer vision, you may you know, kind of wonder that, why is this a challenge? Can't we reconstruct cities already? For example, uh, this is one result, I think from 2005 from Noah Snavely and colleagues, which sort of really caught attention of the computer vision community where they showed using just internet images <clears throat> uh, that people every day have taken of this particular Colosseum, they could reconstruct it in 3D and also figure out where each of the images were taken. Um, and the system, I mean, isn't quite specific to just this one scene. It, of course, also works on other scenes around the world. For example, they could use this the same algorithm to reconstruct other monuments or even entire cities such as Rome. Um, and since these techniques have also been applied to reconstruct uh, other objects in more detail, for example, this particular statue, again, this work is from uh, perhaps late 90s or early 2000s, where in those days we have had the capability of pretty accurately and densely reconstructing objects such as these statues from uh, in this case, a few hundred images. Um, and of course, similar systems let us reconstruct uh, sitting presidents in remarkable detail. Uh, this is actually an image from one of my advisor's students, Paul Debevec, who is standing on the right and is scanning President Obama. And again, these kind of systems lead to reconstructions with a very remarkable amount of detail. So, so given all these successes of being able to model from people's faces in a lot of accurate detail to these huge cities, <clears throat> 
why is 3D reconstruction a problem? And to better illustrate this, I want to draw this axis of how easy it is to make certain inference. That is, if you are interested in reconstructing a new object or a new scene, how much effort do you as a user have to put in to get these kind of 3D reconstructions? And on the one hand of this axis lies the kind of systems that we have been looking at, where either you build um, sort of your customized scanning setup, or at least takes hundreds of thousands of images of the specific scene or object you're interested in, which is really a lot and lot of effort. But on the other hand, as an aspirational goal, we also want to have a system that makes it remarkably easy for a user to infer 3D for a new object that they're interested in. For example, given just a single RGB image of an arbitrary object such as this bird, if you can infer the 3D of the underlying object, and that is a system that allows inference in a very easy way. And so while I've been talking of some of these approaches, I'd argue that they lie more to the left of the spectrum that to construct 3D of a new object, it's not really easy. You need either a lot of images or a customized scanning setup to be able to do this. Uh, but of course, this is not really the only axis that we are interested in. One other axis is that of generality, which is how broadly can your system be applied? And to sort of just better motivate this, I want to you know, highlight the fact that by some estimates in the real world, we have about 10,000 or more object categories, sort of including both real world, uh, including both man-made and natural objects. And so given that there is such a diverse set of object categories, to understand the approaches in terms of you know, how generally are they applicable, what I'd want to consider is, you know, off the shelves, if I download the code of that approach, how many among these 10K categories can it reconstruct? Is it making some very fundamental limiting assumptions that allow it to be only applicable to a very small set of categories? Or is this approach something that can kind of reconstruct anything um, across these 10K categories? And so across this axis, uh, really the structure from motion or the multi-view stereo approaches that I'm showing uh, are extremely general because given the kind of data that they require, they are able to reconstruct any new object given that kind of a data. If you take, so this is just a statue, it's just a very generic and arbitrary category, but you could reconstruct it in very accurate detail uh, given these 100 or 200 images that were required. Uh, but on the other hand, some other systems, which let's say tackle very category specific reconstructions such as for faces and build on the assumption that faces that rely on this low dimensional manifold are inherently restricted on not being able to scale up to these uh, 10,000 categories and would probably lie on the bottom of the success. Um, so given I've sort of drawn this landscape where you know, we want to consider approaches both in terms of how generally they're applicable and how easily they're applicable, I want to briefly you know, paint for you the current landscape of 3D reconstruction approaches. Uh, where of course the multi-view stereo SFM approaches that we looked at earlier, I'd say fall somewhere on sort of the top left of this curve where they're really generally applicable, but for a new scene or an object, you do require a lot of data to be able to apply. Um, and interestingly, this task of 3D inference was perhaps one that was tackled by the very first thesis in computer vision as well, this sort of seminal work by Larry Roberts, which was trying to do single view 3D inference given these restricted scenes constraining of you know, simple block-like objects. And so this work I'd say falls more to sort of the bottom right of the spectrum where you can just infer given a single image, but you're really limited in the class of scenes or the objects that you can infer 3D for. Um, and of course, over the decades, we've sort of made progress on both of these. And in fact, in particular, I'd say for single view reconstruction, uh, over the decades, we've built more model-based detection or deformable model-based reconstruction approaches, which I think push the generality of these approaches a bit. Instead of being limited to sort of one or two categories, we built approaches that could handle, let's say, cars, dolphins, <clears throat> um, airplanes, and beds, um, but at the cost of requiring perhaps some amount of key points or morphable models that are predefined uh, to be able to apply. Uh, but sort of with more recent approaches that came out with deep learning, uh, including works from CMU, for example, the work by Rohit Girdhar and Avina, or some of our works from Berkeley, uh, we pushed this a bit further and I'd say got systems that could make 3D inference from a single image for a slightly broader set of categories. And maybe a recent state of the art system like Mesh ACNN can infer 3D for, let's say, nine object categories pretty reliably. Um, of course, the use of learning did not 
only lead to advances on the bottom right end of this picture, but also something at the top right, which is maybe you're all familiar with the uh, recent work on neural radiance fields, <clears throat> uh, which given images of a particular object or a scene can allow us to reconstruct uh, 3D at a very high quality and sort of really capture the view dependent appearance as well. And sort of following up on this, there have been some more approaches, for example, at the bottom of the page is a work from Simon Lucy's group called Bach, or at the top of the page is this work from Israel, where <clears throat> you could relax the requirements of a very precise camera being known a priori, or could relax the number of images being required from maybe 500 to 100 or 50. Uh -huh. And so, this, these, I'd say, made them slightly easier to apply because you don't require extremely precise cameras. And instead of hundreds of images, you maybe now require 50 images to be able to reconstruct the scene. Um, but we still see that all of these approaches, whether they're tackling single view reconstruction or multi view reconstruction, um, are still pretty far from our aspirational goal, which sort of stands at the top right corner of this chart, where we want to be able to reconstruct, let's say, any generic object from ideally just a single image of that object. Um, and you know, while in this talk, I'll unfortunately not be able to show you an approach that achieves those kind of results, I want to talk about you know, two different projects we have, that we have done to sort of try to take steps towards that in different directions. Um, so first, I want to talk about uh, the one paper which looks at single view reconstruction, but tries to push the number of categories that we can reconstruct. Um, from let's say the nine or 10 categories that prior works could reconstruct to something around 50 to 100 object categories on the tower can allow reconstructing. Uh, and so the second one is to try to look at this problem of multi view reconstruction, but examine methods that can reconstruct not using hundreds of images, but something like just sort of about eight images. And so go, to go from the paradigm of multi view reconstruction to be able to get approaches that tackle sparse view reconstruction. Um, and yeah, so to begin with, I want to focus on uh, the first work that still tackles single view reconstruction. Um, and in particular, this is based on a paper by Judy and Abhinav, uh, with me as a collaborator, titled <coughs> uh, Shelf Supervised Mesh Prediction. And I'll also very briefly touch upon uh, sort of a work that we have in preparation, which is actually just trying to push uh, the previous work further in some directions. <coughs> Sorry, just. I have a question while there's a pause. Yeah. Uh, earlier you said there was about you know ten thousand object categories. Obviously, that's an assumption. Obviously, yeah. depending on how you define it, they'd be more or less. Yeah. And you said you know kind of an interesting question is how many of those can you reconstruct? Mm -hmm. Has have people been working on kind of evaluating that number, like like actually like testing it on this huge range of things, or is that kind of like another goal? Yeah. So I mean, for reasons I'll get into very shortly. A. Unfortunately, we don't even have very accurate data to reliably sort of test that system, test that out. Um, and I would still say that, so at least if you're thinking of it from downloading code and being able to run perspective, then for at least the single view reconstruction system is it's kind of pretty clear because they're, each of the papers is typically, they release their system which can only handle six predefined categories. So in that sense, it's pretty clear that some of the single view reconstruction approaches really don't scale to very many beyond seven or eight. It's an interesting question to test, let's say, you know, some of the multi-view reconstruction approaches like NERF or something else, how broadly are they applicable? Um, but at least sort of my guess is that given what we know of the method, there really is no fundamental restriction that will just let them work on a generic object. Um, yeah. So happy to take any other questions as well. Okay, good, moving on. Again, feel free to stop me at any point. Um, so in this particular work, we, want, we are looking at the setting of single view reconstruction. So it sort of lies uh, at the right-hand boundary of this ease of inference curve. And what we are really interested in pushing is the generality of these approaches from approaches that can reconstruct something like just blocks or faces uh, to maybe tens of categories to hopefully hundred categories and more. And one question that you may have is, you know, why is this hard, why is, it's not very easily possible to get approaches that work on a very broad set of categories in particular, because you've seen such amazing results in object detection, 
which do work well across you know very broad set of categories. Uh, for example, this is an image from the Elvis data set, which has instance segmentations for I think something like a thousand object categories. And you know, systems trained on this data set can perhaps not as accurately, but still segment out the various kinds of objects that are present in seeds. And so given that we have such capabilities of models that can generally recognize and detect objects, why don't we have systems that can more generally reconstruct objects? And so as one of the questions earlier alluded to, I'd say one of the fundamental reasons for this is that getting 3D annotations or 3D data for objects in generic images is extremely expensive and sometimes infeasible. Um, so this is, I think, yeah, so this is a clip of uh, some annotation system from Stanford from a few years back, where to annotate the 3D structure of the particular car in this image, what they have to do is first select one of few CAD models that perhaps best fits the car. And so this is not an accurate 3D annotation, it's just an approximate 3D segmentation or 3D annotation. And once they've identified a reasonable template, you have to very precisely align it in terms of camera pose and key points to this particular image. And it takes over a minute to get 3D, not ground through 3D, but even just approximate 3D for a generic object. And someone also has to sort of pre-collect these templates that can uh, sufficiently explain all different objects, which also is hard to do. And so while 3D annotation is extremely expensive, on the other hand, 2D annotation is extremely fast. Uh, for example, you can just demarcate bounding boxes of objects, or uh, if you want to label segmentations, annotate a few points, and within perhaps five seconds, you can at least get pretty accurate segmentations and segmentation annotations of generic objects without having the reliance on some predefined templates, and these are often pretty accurate. And so because 3D annotation is expensive, that fundamentally limits what learning approaches can do if they're relying on such 3D supervision for learning. And you know, similar to us, a lot of approaches have actually looked at trying to learn 3D without 3D, 3D supervision in the hope that this allows us to scale prediction systems and sort of climb on the generality ladder. And in particular, the kind of supervisions that people have looked at using um, sort of vary from multi-view data that maybe we have three images of the same object and sort of many such objects, or maybe we have very limited variation of shape in a category and also know an approximate template to begin with, um, or we have images with known ground truth camera poses, or perhaps we have some sparse set of key points that have been annotated, which can guide some aspects about learning three. And so all of these approaches uh, through using these other kind of supervisions instead of requiring ground truth 3D supervision, can actually learn 3D in a, in a more scalable manner. But I'd argue that because they still inherently rely on some additional supervision, like multiple images of an object, or if they're using templates, rely on the fact that the shapes within a category, such as horses, don't really deviate too much for a template, too much from the template. They're inherently limited in the kind of categories they can reconstruct um, at the time. And so in contrast, we want to get rid of even all of these assumptions. And be able to learn 3D without any 3D supervision and without any of multi-view or template or camera pose or key point supervision. But so beyond these, one supervision that we do think is very easily and accessible is just foreground masks of objects. Um, so for example, this is uh, a clip from the open images data set where we're just exploring it. And uh, for example, if you search for a category of eagles, uh, you can find that there are many accurate annotations for this particular category. And similarly for many other categories and also the Elvis data set that I was talking about earlier is a different source of being able to get relatively accurate segmentation masks across different objects. <clears throat> so one form of annotation that is rather easily available are these foreground masks. So given any category that we are interested in, we can conceivably get hundreds to thousands of images with at least relatively accurate 2D segmentation masks. And we wanted to ask whether we can learn 3D inference using just this kind of annotation. Um, so more concretely, the task that you're interested in is learning 3D inference or this sort of, given a single image, we want to learn a neural network F that can infer the 3D shape and pose for an object, but using only training data of the following form that there are multiple images of that category with sort of approximate foreground segmentation masks. And using just this, we want to be able to learn the 3D prediction system F that I've shown above. Um, and 
to, to be able to do this, um, sort of a high level approach is actually extremely simple. Uh, we just use sort of a combination of two terms. So given an input image, we have a prediction system that I'll get into uh, in a bit that predicts the camera pose and the 3D shape uh, with texture. And given this, we render this particular prediction from the predicted viewpoint. And then we just say that this rendered 3D shape should match the original input image that we have. And then we say that when this 3D shape is rendered from a random novel viewpoint, it should look something that's like a bird. So just the combination of these two terms, one, that the predicted shape from the predicted viewpoint should match the original image. And the predicted shape rendered from a novel viewpoint should look realistic. It should not look something arbitrary. Just a combination of these two uh, with some additional tricks that I'll get into, let us learn 3D inference uh, from just these segmented uh, image collections. Um, and maybe to go into a bit more detail into each of these. Uh, so concretely, our approach actually takes a two-step inference path, where given an image, we first infer the camera pose and a volumetric representation. And then we sort of meshify and refine that volumetric representation. And so the first step is what we call sort of a category level volumetric reconstruction. And the second step lets us do instance level mesh specialization. Um, and most of the learning really happens in the first part. And the second part is something that just makes our predictions agree and match the image details a bit more. Um, and so sort of to be able to learn and this sort of volumetric representation that I'm mentioning, it actually also has two components. One, at each 3D cell or voxel, it predicts an occupancy of that voxel being occupied or not, and also associates sort of a arbitrary high dimensional feature with that voxel. Um, so concretely given an image, we construct this feature grid in 3D, as well as an occupancy grid in 3D, and also in per viewpoint. And then given this feature and occupancy grid, we can just render using standard volumetric rendering approaches, sort of the feature at each pixel, and using that rendered feature can just do very tiny sort of lightweight convolutions to kind of render an image. So you can just think of it sort of this step as a differentiable renderer that renders the features by accounting for the predicted occupancy through the ray. Um, and so we can go into more details if you want, but this is just sort of very standard volumetric rendering techniques, uh, which render a feature and from that the image. And sort of, so given any viewpoint, this allows us to render both an expected image and the foreground mask using just the occupancy um, through sort of, again, this differentiable ray tracing through the feature grid that I was mentioning. Um, and once we have done this, we can just say that the rendered image that we have from a predicted viewpoint should match the original input image and the original mask. And sort of as I was alluding to earlier, we then just say that given an arbitrary random viewpoint v prime, we again render a different image and say that it should match uh, our notion of birdness, that it should look like a bird. And sort of more concretely, the, the, the loss terms that we use are the two mentioned above, which is the first loss term just says that the rendered image should match the original image. And the second image, the second loss term just says that the rendered image should look realistic under a learned discriminator, where the discriminator is trying to sort of distinguish the generated images from real ones. And just the combination of these two allows us to learn this 3D inference system that is inferring category level <clears throat> volumetric occupancy grids with some features. Just to maybe you know, show that some of these aspects are important. So in the approach that I described earlier, if we don't use this differentiable ray tracing to render features, but just use the fully learned function to render the features along array, which doesn't include sort of the geometry or the occupancy grid, then we get results that don't really respect the shape, even though the renderings that we get actually uh, kind of look reasonable. So this is just to highlight the fact that when we are rendering the value at a pixel, it is kind of important to account for the fact that there is an occupancy grid. And as you're traveling along the ray, that has sort of a multiplicative effect. Um, and this is what we get if we don't use any RGB supervision, but only sort of use their approach to match the 2D masks that are available from the views. So all the discriminator and the L1 losses are not on the RGB, but only on the foreground mask, and that doesn't quite work well. Uh, whereas if we do use the combination of all of these, then we get results that are sort of more passive. 
And sort of recall that we are able to do this using just about a few hundred images of chairs with approximate segmentation. And <clears throat> so once we have this at least coarse 3D reconstruction, we then just optimize it in a very simple way. We first convert it to a mesh and then just optimize the vertices and texture on this mesh to sort of better match the input that we're seeing. So in particular, we first construct a mesh, paint it with the texture, and then <clears throat> sort of refine that texture, accounting for the visibility to better match what's in the input image. So this allows us to sort of add a bit more detail to both the shape and the texture to better match the input image. And yeah, just sort of using a combination of these two, again, using just a few hundred images for each category with approximate segmentation mask, you're able to learn some systems like these, which can predict at least accurate 3D at a course level for a broad set of categories. So here I'm showing results for chairs, maybe for some birds, where it can at least handle you know, the deformations like a duck versus a more normal bird. And actually that deformation is pretty hard for a template-based approach to handle because the shape is changing a lot. Um, and so the more interestingly, we can then try it on other generic animal categories where again, it at least discovers the core structure of them. And again, using just ImageNet images, using off the shelf segmentation systems for these. Um, so for example, for uh, camels here, we had maybe two to 500 images with just segmentations using uh, a system trained on MSCO. And I think what was maybe a bit more exciting for me was that really we can at least just deploy the system on more arbitrary categories like purses and bagels. And it does at least discover the structure of them and can, yeah. Yeah, so I guess I'll just repeat the question, which was how do you evaluate the 3D reconstruction that you have? Um, so for a limited set of categories, there exist data sets. And so on those data sets, we did empirically evaluate our reconstruction across uh, to how closely it resembles actually an already approximate ground truth. Um, and so in that, we compared against some other approaches. But yes, unfortunately, for the kind of categories that we can reconstruct here, or maybe sort of even in this slide where we really get to reconstruction of maybe 50 to 100 categories, it's not very easy to be able to, recon uh, to evaluate this. Um, I would like to mention that there are some data sets coming out where people are scanning generic objects. Um, and at least I think that will allow us a small number of evaluation samples per category. And it's unclear if that will be sufficient for learning, but maybe a small number of scanned objects will allow us to evaluate and be more concrete about benchmarking than we just showing some of these visuals. But yes, sort of at the end, what I was personally excited about was that given just a few hundred images of objects like guitars at the bottom um, or things like faucets somewhere in the middle, we can learn the 3D structure of that category and can reconstruct a relatively large set of categories without really having any 3D supervision or any template supervision or any key point supervision. And we can then also just deploy the learned system in some MS Cocoa images that we can just take some detections. Uh, and I'd like to note that these detections have occluded objects, whereas our system was trained on unoccluded objects with sort of full, fully visible objects. So it doesn't transfer as well directly, but it still does an okay job. And in particular for some of the food items uh, give slightly better reconstructions, maybe because these food items are also fully visible, uh, unlike some of the furniture items in the previous edition. And so one caveat that I want to highlight of this approach is that it learns something that is very, very category specific. So the learning paradigm is that given a few hundred images of words, we learn a single model that can only explain words. And so for each of the 50 categories, for example, that I was explaining, for birds, there's a separate model that reconstructs. For cars, there's a separate model that is independently learned. Um, for kangaroos, there's a separate model that's independently learned. And let's say so on for hats, there's sort of the nth model, which is independently learned. Um, and so there are multiple disadvantages of this. One, that we are learning a large number of models. And so you know, you, there are a lot of things, parameters we need to learn if we want to reconstruct objects. Uh, but the more fundamental one is 
if we have learned to reconstruct, let's say, Okapi is in giraffes, then we can't adapt that knowledge to then learn reconstruction of zebras, which may be similar to the original categories in some way. And so an ongoing work that we have uh, is where we are looking at having a unified model learn reconstruction across all these categories while also sort of continually adapting it. Uh, now, unfortunately, learning just a single model using the losses that I showed earlier doesn't quite work because you know the large amount of variation with the very little supervision kind of makes the training unstable. But what we can learn is first learn these independent models across n starting categories and then just distill them into a common model and then continually adapt that model to newer categories and then keep distilling them back to the single model. So the sort of overall approach of independently learning category level models and then distilling them back into the single model makes the training more stable. And at the end of the day, this sort of common distilled model that we learn is actually better at reconstructing each of the individual categories than any of those individual models. Um, but sort of, as I said, this is maybe ongoing work and I'll have more results on this hopefully in a month or so. But yeah, I'm happy to take any questions on this part of the talk. Before moving on. Yeah. Uh, so how long does it, so yeah. the question was, how long does it take to reconstruct a model? Um, so maybe I'll answer that in two parts. So to train a new model for a new category, it takes, I think about a day to reconstruct, given a single image, it's just a feed forward pass. And that's, I think, probably something like one tenth of a second. Uh, yeah, of that order. Yeah. Yeah, so for training, uh, because it's a convolutional neural network, we have to fix the input resolution. And I think in the work, it was something like 128 cross 128. I have a question. Uh, yeah. yeah. So when you move from, like, when you have trained N model and when you go to N plus one model, uh, like how does the performance of the previous N model get affected? Like, does it, is there a law, like, Usually, like usually, there is continual learning for adding new models to your stuff. So, are you using any continual learning methods here to so, add more models to this? So, okay, and the honest answer is that some of that protocol is still under construction. But something that we almost converged on is we train models on, let's say, fifty categories, mm -hmm. distill them into one model, then adapt this model to 40 new categories independently and then distill it back to have a 90 category model and then sort of keep adding in some multiples of 10, if that makes sense. And on the question of how does the performance work on the original categories, mm -hmm. surprisingly, it actually improves because right now, given this very small amount of data, the independent models that are learned are just learned independently on, let's say, categories like horses and zebras. But once you distill them into a common model, uh, sort of surprisingly, the commonality across them makes that model better on both of these original categories as well. Okay. So is it more like a meta-learning approach? Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, there are ties to meta-learning in the sense, some of the meta-learning models like Mammal or Replica do learn this common model that can very quickly adapt to a category. But unlike those, we are not explicitly having any of these meta learning losses, which say that our model should be fast, quickly adaptable. In this, our goal is just to have this common model that can work reliably well across all of them. And how different are the new models, like compared to the old model? Like how 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 much incrementally are you changing? So uh, we add sort of k new categories and just retrain the model from scratch or sorry, not retrain we fine tune the original model to now distill instead of n n plus k models um, so i assume it changes a lot because we're not really taking incremental steps as in a continual learning setting we're just saying okay we had one model that had seen 50 categories we used it to learn 40 new categories independently and now let's just combine it together to get a 90 category model again so it's not a very continual thing in the sense we are not adding one new category to this model at a time, we are adding a large set of categories at a time. Yes. Um, so I have 
two kind of related questions. So the first one is, did you also experiment with, instead of learning uh, uh, to construct objects from um, manually labeled segmentation masks, using like a trained model or to give you like less, less precise masks? So like, um, one person, so on that, yeah, I have to repeat the question. The question was, did we try learning uh, some of the category specific models from approximate segmentation from off the shelf systems? Um, and I, I believe for birds, we did have that ablation and there wasn't that much of a difference. For some of the other categories, for example, all the quadruped categories that I was showing, we did not even have the ground root segmentations on ImageNet, we just actually used off the shelf segmentations. So the slide of results where I was showing you maybe 50 categories, I'd say more than half of them were learned using off the shelf segmentation systems. And the, and the second question has also really goes back to your motivation where we were showing that robots observe just the image of the environment, right? Mm -hmm. And actually in reality, a robot observes extreme mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, so it would also kind of probably make sense to make use of that information, right? Mm -hmm. like you can get like different views of uh, one object. Basically. Yeah, yeah. So I think, uh, I guess the question is, a robot doesn't have a static view of a scene, it can move around. Um, and I think it's sort of a balance between this problem statement as it's formulated right now, maybe is more applicable for understanding internet images or if you want to capture one image and create content for VR and might just be a stepping stone for what to do with a particular robot, which can, where there are many questions. So if you have a very small amount of motion that the robot is doing, then there are still very strong similarities because a small amount of motion just gives you something like depth parallax. So instead of an RGB image, it's something like an RGBD image, uh, but you still want the full 3D of things. But yes, if your robot can move around a significantly large amount, uh, then you might need to, uh, that might simplify the problem a lot and you might not necessarily need to rely on just this. Um, so, you said on the slide before, uh, your motivation was to have learning go across categories, kind of uh, mm -hmm. use information from other categories. There would be two ways to do this in your all combined model. You could have this model be conditioned on what the category is, mm -hmm. you would still learn information or not. Yeah. And in this setting where it's not, you might be able to apply this to completely novel categories yeah. without retraining. Uh, so which setting is it? And do you kind of try to test it on novel categories without seeing any examples? Yes, so right now we are doing it in just a setting where there is no category information. And on novel categories, actually, in fact, that's how we start. So when we are adapting it to a new category, we use the predictions that the model is giving and using those optimize the cameras a bit and then allow the shape to learn. So it, for new categories, of course, it varies a bit on how similar categories it has seen earlier. But often we see that the predictions are meaningful, but as you train, they become better. What, what happens when you don't have this adversarial loss? Um, so in the previous work, the adversarial loss was critical because otherwise there are certain degenerate solutions that everything can always be flat and explain back this image. In the current work that we are doing, where you are distilling the model, if you start with a small amount of 3D supervision on some set of categories, then that actually does away with the need of an adversarial loss. So if you're already starting with a model that has seen some 3D data on some categories and are building on top of that, then at least empirically, which is slightly surprising to me, you don't need that adversarial loss. Okay, makes sense. Uh, yeah, I'm going to stop there. Uh, okay, great. So I think the, part, the talk so far was focusing on maybe scaling up the kind of categories that we can reconstruct from a single image. Uh, but there's this other direction that we can also attack this problem of, which is maybe just trying to make acquisition of models simpler. That, you know, suppose instead of requiring hundreds or thousands of images for a particular object, if we could just reconstruct a new object given just eight views, then that can perhaps uh, let us acquire data for 3D inference more easily. And so with that in mind, we wanted to look at this task of sparse view 3D reconstruction, which takes a step from previous methods in multi-view reconstruction by requiring sort of a far fewer set of views. And as I'll get into also more approximate cameras. Um, and so this part of the talk is actually based on um, joint work with Jason 
in Shenandeva, and this is something that will come out at New Rips this year. And so as I said, the task that you were looking at in this work is that of sparse fury construction. Um, so in particular, if let's say you're interested in selling your car, uh, you might upload eight images of it uh, to, in this particular case, I think Craigslist. Um, and given just these eight images, we want to be able to reconstruct the underlying object. And so just to convince you that this is a very challenging setting, uh, this is a typical result that Colmap gives on these kind of sequences. Uh, now I'm actually cheating a bit here because this cold map result is from a different image set, which actually had more images than this particular one, but it's still sort of a pretty typical cold map result that we get. Uh, in this case, using even 12 images, because there's very little overlap between the different views. There's a lot of specularity on the objects. Um, and so some of the registration approaches don't really work. Uh, and in fact, I think Jason and Genshing tried cold map on maybe 10 different image sets. And this was perhaps the best result that we could get across all of them but there are a lot of false matches. And while you get some plane of a card, it doesn't quite work very well. Uh, but that was just to sort of convince you that, you know, the setting is hard where some of the traditional tools don't really transfer very well. Um, and so what our approach aims to do is given these images with off the shelf segmentations from let's say any detection system trained on cards that you can get these core segmentation ones and an approximate category level template shape. So we have this very sedan-like template shape for even reconstructing this truck, which is very visibly different from it. And again, approximate cameras, either using off the shelf system or just sort of binning by the user in let's say 30 degree increments, which is extremely close. So just using these inputs, we want to be able to reconstruct um, the 3D model of the underlying object and also model some view dependent lighting effects such as um, the shininess of the car and you know modeling those view dependent effects lets us both a get a better model and b optimize better because sort of now our model is more expensive um, and so also we can do this not just for cars but also for more generic objects and i think this is a desktop monitor that jason captured somewhere in smith hall uh, from eight images and this will sort of convince you that this does work more broadly than the small number of instances I was showing. Uh, we just scraped, I think, 200 image sets from Craigslist and using all those cards can reconstruct 3D models across this using, again, off the shelf systems for inferring camera pose and, uh, <clears throat> and segmentation. And in some sense, this problem setup is very similar to what papers like NERF or neural radiance field tackle where again, they want to infer the 3D structure and view dependent effects. And they can actually do this very successfully for many complex objects, such as these hot dogs or the drums. And the reason why this works so well is because it can sort of handle arbitrary geometry and appearance. Uh, so sort of a one minute summary of NERF is that at each point in 3D space, it models a density, which is sort of like a continuous occupancy at that location and a view dependent lighting effect. And this allows it to express things like clouds or rigid surfaces and allows it to handle arbitrary illumination. But unfortunately, it's just this expressivity that makes NERF not work very well for our particular set. Because if you have sort of an extremely expressive and a powerful model, then given a very sparse amount of data, such as just eight views, it is prone to get into local optima and doesn't quite um, get model view dependent effects very well. And in fact, the results that I'm showing at the bottom were after we tried really hard for two weeks to improve NERF and added lots of bells and whistles to sort of make it as well work as well as possible. And just to play this again, it doesn't really capture the appearance or the geometry that well. And sort of our insight to allow reconstruction in the sparse view setting was actually just very simple. to restrict this expressivity and to constrain both the geometry model by saying that most of the objects have well-defined surfaces. So that should be something that's in there. And the second is NERF allows arbitrary view dependent variation. Whereas in computer graphics, we know that there are more constrained and realistic models of appearance and that we can include those as opposed to just allowing arbitrary learned neural radius fields. And just using these two, uh, which I'll describe how lets us learn the 3D inference 
from just these edge server images and get relatively more accurate 3D models with also slight effects. Um, <clears throat> and so the shape representation that we use explicitly models the geometry as sort of a deformation of a unit sphere. So given any point UV on a unit sphere, we have a neural network that maps it to a real world 3D coordinate. And so by construction, this neural network deforms the original sphere into some other deformed mesh, but still sort of guarantees a watertight geometry. Um, and through some tricks in the encoding, we can ensure that you can still recover a large amount of precise detail. If you um, so shape representation is very simple. It's a neurally deformed sphere representation. Um, but what sort of is more interesting to me at least is how can we model view dependent lighting effects while still constraining the appearance models. And so sort of more concretely, when we are rendering a particular pixel, the question that we are answering is, if I'm viewing a particular point X from a direction V, how much light will I observe? Um, and so again, we are viewing this particular point X on a surface from, from the camera, and that corresponds to direction V. And in computer graphics, uh, there's this sort of very well-known and standard surface rendering equation. To, to answer this question, which is so the outgoing light in direction V from a point X essentially just integrates all the incoming light and using sort of the BRDF, which controls what fraction of that incoming light gets reflected, just integrates all incoming light from all possible directions. Um, and so given that we know this, what the nerve for the radiance field solution is, is let's just forget about all the surface rendering and model the outgoing light at a particular point X through a learned neural network. And instead, our solution is that in this sort of model of lighting, most of the terms are geometry based. The only terms that need to be sort of learned are the lighting and the BRDF ones. And we can learn neural models for those instead of sort of throwing away our knowledge of what surface rendering looks like. Um, and sort of in particular, we make two assumptions about the lighting uh, and sort of the ideas. So the first one is that the lighting is independent of the point, that this corresponds to some sort of an environment map, which is equivalent to saying that lights are all far away, or it's like a car outside and the lighting is coming from the sky. Um, so concretely what this amounts to is the light incident at a point X from direction omega is independent of the particular point X. It only depends on the incoming direction omega. Um, and if we make this assumption, then the lighting can again be modeled as a spherical neural network that takes in a direction omega and outputs the amount of light from that direction omega. Uh, the second assumption that we make is instead of using a very generic model of VRDF, we use a form reflection model, which is far more constrained. And you know, I agree there are better models for it, but uh, sort of in particular, the form model decomposes the appearance at a particular point into a diffuse component which doesn't depend on the view and a view dependent specular component. And um, sort of given this, the surface rendering equation looks like at each point, we compute the diffuse light incoming and multiply it by the inherent texture of that point and add the specular effects where this texture at a particular point can again be modeled as a neural surface, uh, sort of as a neural network that maps a point on a surface of a sphere to an RGB value. Um, so sort of at the end of the day, we have this more constrained appearance model that given this reference view where I'm showing this image just to tell you about the camera viewpoint from which we are entering, uh, and a particular shape, which is a neural network, a particular texture, which is also modeled as a neural network, and an environment map, which again is a neural network. So the three things that we are learning are these three neural networks, which take in a point on a sphere and either predict its deformation or the texture um, or the lighting from that direction. So given these, we can kind of render the geometry from a particular viewpoint. And given the geometry and the lighting, compute how much diffused lighting is there at a particular point and get the view, view independent effects and also add the specular lighting uh, to finally get sort of the view dependent rendering of this. And so given this rendering model, all we need to do is just optimize some standard 
input image reconstruction losses where we just say that uh, the renderings of what we are learning should match the original images, uh, the mask and the image content with some regularization. And we just optimize the weights of the three neural networks, the camera parameters, as well as some of the specular coefficients which control you know, how shiny or how matte the material is. Um, and yeah, given just this, we are able to learn the surface-based neural representation for reconstructing new objects while also accounting for sort of environment lighting and view dependent effects. Um, and sort of as I was alluding to earlier, we use a course template shape to initialize um, using this sort of particular code base and also just use an approximate camera using an off-the-shelf system, in particular this one from Jiao uh, et al, which given a course template and an image gives us some pose which is typically accurate, let's say within 30 degrees. Yeah, so given just these, we are able to reconstruct sort of the 3D that I'm showing in the middle and also some image on the right, which is just showing you the view dependent effects overlaid with a mean texture. So all the shininess there is really the view dependent effects. Um, and what's interesting to me is that the same initial shape can capture very different geometries. For example, the Jeep at the top, of the truck and the CRV at the bottom. And sort of again, as I showed earlier, is sort of again, using the same initial shape and same of the shell system, uh, we're able to reconstruct a relatively broad set of uh, objects like cards with a large amount of variation. <clears throat> and five minutes. Okay. Um, now, one of the challenging things in this case was evaluation, which is you know, how well do we evaluate the reconstruction accuracy or the view generation accuracy of someone. And the typical way of evaluation in multi-view reconstruction or NERF literature is that of novel view synthesis. So more concretely, given a few input images, uh, an approach is supposed to learn a 3D representation. And given a held out target image, we just query this 3D representation for generating that particular view and ask how well is it that we match that particular view. Now, one implicit assumption that no one really talks about in this evaluation setup is that you're assuming very precise known cameras in this setting. So to evaluate by novel view synthesis, you're assuming that you almost always have precise ground truth cameras for your input images, and more importantly, have precise ground truth camera for a query image, because you're saying that this car should look like this when viewed from elevation 22 degrees and azimuth 36 degrees. But in the while, we don't really have precise cameras to sort of use this evaluation as it's. And so that was sort of one challenge that we had to overcome to evaluate our reconstructions. Um, and we actually did this in two ways. One, which is maybe a slightly boring way that is more corresponding to how people evaluate using ground truth cameras, where Jason manually sat and fixed pseudo ground truth cameras and optimized cameras to treat as ground truth uh, for a few of these sequences. And so this evaluation is corresponds to the standard way of evaluation where a user has to manually correct cameras. But this doesn't really ex like capture how robust the system is to in the wild cameras that are inaccurate. And so the second approach that I'll maybe focus in to a bit more detail is we allow methods to train using approximate cameras, but then at test time, also allow the methods to refine their own camera a bit to generate the held out target image as closely as possible. Um, and we were using some scraped images of Craigslist and training models in a held one, held one out way. So if a particular image set has eight images, we'll train eight different nurse models using seven images each and evaluate it on the eighth image. Um, and we do this sort of a lot of times um, with some of the standard baselines you would expect. And given our five minutes, I'll sort of skip the first evaluation, which I'd say is sort of not the correct one for in the wild settings. But so sort of the second evaluation protocol is you're training all these methods with just approximate off the shelf cameras and allow all these methods to optimize their own cameras. And then at test time, we give them a held out image again with an approximate camera and then ask methods to possibly refine the camera to generate this held out image as best as possible. So the question all of 
question we are trying to answer is, is this 3D representation capable of generating this image from any viewpoint and not just from the initial approximate viewpoint that we happen to have? Um, and so under this metric, we compared our system to this NERF star, which I'm, as I mentioned is NERF with a lot of bells and whistles to make it even work plausibly in the setting. And also this IDR approach, which is actually an interesting middle ground between our approach and NERF, where it sort of uses a surface-based representation, but doesn't use any constrained lighting models. It uses still a very free form and arbitrary radiance, neural radiance field model of lighting. And so it doesn't, and even its surface representation is uh, probably too expressive to allow learning in this particular setup. Um, and I believe we have some comparisons. Yeah. So the leftmost result is showing our system and the rightmost result is actually showing our system. But if we don't use any constrained lighting models uh, where we allow each point on the surface to have a nerf like arbitrary radiance field. And we again see that that sort of allows the model to overfit a lot. If I were to show you the training views, it would look accurate. But if we generate novel views, then it does not look accurate and so it doesn't perform as well. Um, and so sort of, again, what was maybe more exciting to me beyond reconstructing cars is that we could just use the system to reconstruct more generic objects in the household sort of as an homage to Pittsburgh, we reconstructed a Heinz ketchup bottle um, or just a uh, sort of PS4 controller, again, using just eight images. Uh, and with just a cuboidal initialization with very approximate poses um, and just more objects from everyday settings. Doesn't necessarily capture all the details very precisely, but of course it's still a lot more accurate than some of the single reconstruction systems that we were seeing earlier. Uh, and yeah, with that, I think I basically want you to take this sort of image from my talk today, which is you know, ideally we do want a system that performs something close to that sort of star at the top right of the screen. Uh, but in this talk, I showed you two different little steps towards hopefully getting there. And yeah, happy to take any questions. Great. So uh, we can take questions. Um, yeah, I think there's one in the back. Yeah, so as you just mentioned, the, the last stage of or the, the output here uh, is like a really good course model with any of this is something like that. Yeah. Um, are there any like ways that people in the past have kind of like tried to do optimization on top of that in order to get an even higher detail? Yeah, so I believe if we so I, I repeat the question. So the question was, we do get a reasonably accurate model, for example, for this fire hydrant, but some of the details such as the chain, for example, are not very accurate. And so is there some way we can refine this to now better get those details? Um, and I think that question to some extent ties in a bit with how accurate cameras do you believe you have? So if, for instance, you really trusted your camera's calibration, then there are methods you could use, which let's say from this surface-like representation, you can transform it to a volumetric representation, which allows you more flexibility and then fine tune it from there. And I believe if your cameras are very accurate, you will get this, you will improve your details. But on the other hand, if you don't think your cameras are very accurate, then you might get more sort of artifacts as opposed to details. Uh, but I guess the high level answer is that given this, you could treat this, this as an initialization and refine this in a volumetric or an SDF based representation. But for that to actually work in practice, you might need a better starting point with respect to cameras. Uh, just to follow up on that, like is it uh, possible to like, make the 3D uh, after making the 3D model, go back to a 2D model and software with input? Like there are input images and yeah. add some orientation and then we go from the 3D model to the 2D uh, projection and then do a loss function. Yeah, so the question is, is it possible to go back from 3D to the 2D images and compare and use that as loss function? In fact, I mean, that was exactly how we were training in the sense we are learning these neural networks by exactly minimizing this loss function that on the input images or sort of the seven or eight views that we have, it should agree with those views. And so 
In fact, that is exactly how we are training this particular system. Okay, so all the three net networks are getting affected. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Um, there's a lot of questions about other people are for questions. Um, so the, the second project um, is uh, you're morphing a sphere into this object. So do you have thoughts on how to send that to objects that are not genus zero? Yeah, so uh, I'll just repeat the question, which is how do you generalize the second project to objects that are not genus zero? Um, there are a couple of ways of doing this. One, if you a priori know the genus of the object, then obviously you could, instead of sphere, start with a donut and you can define similar neural mappings there and everything will work out. Um, if that is also not a priori, you know, then I believe one possible approach is to start with a very coarse volumetric representation, but not something like NERF that has uh, a lot of detail, just to get some approximate geometry. Once you have that geometry, extract the surface and then sort of neurally learn that surface. But I'm not entirely sure how much variation that can handle, whether it can handle, let's say, thin structures and chairs, et cetera, or not. Got it. Cool. Um, another question I had is for the second project, it looks like you're learning an implicit representation of a term of continuous point on the sphere. Um, and uh, do you find that there's large benefit to doing that as opposed to explicit representation? Yeah. So Dave's question is, the second project uses an implicit representation as a continual mapping of a sphere, and is that better than explicit? So first, I think I've had a lot of arguments with people, and like a lot of people don't like this being called an implicit representation because this is still just a deformed surface. It's not an implicit representation in the sense there's no 3D function whose zero crossing we are representing as a surface, which maybe the purists like to call implicit. Um, but yeah, this is a neural representation of a surface compared to a discrete vertex based representation of a surface. Um, so I believe for texture, there was definitely a sort of huge advantage to being able to use this. And we get a lot of details like license plates of cars, which you can't very easily unless you have a very high resolution one. For surfaces as well, I think this representation offers you some benefits that the continuity you get for free, because if you have, let's say, 642 vertices representing your shape, then vertex number one and vertex number five are treated independently, even though they might be close by. Whereas this representation just gives you some of that continuity and manifold structure for free, because the query points to the neural network are all close by. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think you get more detail at a fixed resolution. Or, I mean, there is no resolution. Do you see any, any disadvantages with the implicit, with the neural representation, like lack of, uh, like failure to generalize sometimes or something like that? Or, or hmm. Do we see any disadvantages? Actually, in this particular case, I, I'm hard pressed to think of any. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, so there's another question. Yeah. So I guess there were two questions. One is given, in, given a new shape, how do you, or given a new set of images, how do you decide what initialization to start from? Um, I hope that is the correct. Yeah. So on that, uh, I guess for cars, we just arbitrarily chose this one sedan-like car and we're just always starting from that. Um, for all the other objects that I've showed here, we just started with a cuboid, but tried to, give it approximately the right dimensions. We just found that if we start from something completely arbitrary like a sphere, it didn't quite work well because the camera poses were also not accurate and we were optimizing those as well with respect to the shape. So as long as we started with the cuboid with roughly the right dimensions, it worked reasonably well. Um, the second question was um, regarding getting better details. There are people in, let's say, who are predicting optical flow or stereo matching where looking at sub-pixel prediction helps. Um, so 
And actually, say for us, not being able to get good detail was not necessarily a matter of not capturing subpixel, not being able to look at subpixel things, but more a limit of the representation that it's just a genus zero deformation and a limit of the setting we were looking at, which is given the lack of very precise cameras, I don't think it's possible to sort of resolve all the details from the shape. But that's not entirely 100% sure of that answer. Uh, maybe I'll ask another question. Um, for the first project, if I recall, you did uh, the instance level optimization as a second step. And it looked like from your side that's where you were optimizing over the color of the object. Yes, so both color and the geometry of it. So given a volumetric representation, we initialized a mesh with some texture that was predicted from the volumetric one and then better match the texture and the mesh. Right, so my question is, if you're doing instance level optimization yeah. over color um, from a single viewpoint, how were you able to predict the color of the backside of the object? Oh, so we uh, did, so the question was, how do you capture the color at the other as, like other side of the object um, in the first project? And we did it in a hacky way where we assumed that all objects that we are considering have XY symmetry at least. Um, so that allows you to do something. And for the regions that you don't observe, uh, don't change them too much. Don't change. Don't change the So for instance, if you're seeing the front of a car, so we do predict texture based on a volumetric representation as well, oh, okay. because we were rendering these realistic birds. So there is some texture that lies on the mesh. Um, for the regions that we directly observe, we allow that to be overwritten. Uh, for the regions that we don't observe, we don't allow it to be overwritten. Right. Okay. Got it. Any other questions? Any other questions? And let's thank you about again. Thank you. Thank you.